welcome to the EPG Patshala. This is the paper on morphology and syntax. I am Prabal Das Gupta of the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. And in this particular module, we shall cover the morpheme. The morpheme is a concept that we have not introduced so far. And you might have been wondering why. It is surely obvious to you that phonology spends much of its energy studying phonemes. So you might have wondered whether morphology would correspondingly turn out to be a study of morphemes. And indeed, there used to be many linguists who believed that that was the right way to do morphology. Those linguists had set up a system that they called structuralism. Structural linguists believed very strongly in the parallelism between phonology and morphology. They tried to set up their theories and their constructs in such a way that nearly identical statements could be made in phonology of the structuralist kind and in morphology of the structuralist kind. The basis of their method of research used to be to imagine that at every level of linguistic analysis, there is a fundamental type of unit. The fundamental unit of phonology then is the phoneme. That of morphology is the morpheme. They also believed that around this unit, you could organize the study of that level of analysis in terms of functional differentiation. In other words, each unit took different forms in different environments. One phoneme, they believed, would appear in different variants that they called allophones in different contexts. This is something that you have studied in your phonology lessons. Likewise, they wanted to argue that one morpheme appears in different variants, which they called allomorphs, in different environments. And they believed that this variation could be shown to be exactly parallel to allophonic variation within the phoneme. Why were they doing all this? The reason why structuralist morphology based everything on the morpheme phoneme parallel is that they were suspicious of the word. They didn't see why words exist in human languages. They could not find any rationale to the concept of the word. So they wanted to avoid using the word as a fundamental theoretical concept as much as possible. Why did they fixate on the morpheme as an idea? The reason that the structuralists arrived at the morpheme as an idea was that they were looking at minimal configurations. They thought of the phoneme as a minimal configuration of sound. A vowel or a consonant seems to be a given. Most ways of talking about pronunciation in the traditions of the world have postulated vowels and consonants. And it was fairly straightforward for structural linguists to put vowels and consonants together and construct a class of phonemes. So there will be phonemes of two kinds, the vowel kind and the consonant kind. Likewise, they felt that when words are chopped up into pieces, these pieces are basically of two kinds. There are roots and there are affixes. And they felt that just as vowels and consonants can be unified as phonemes, likewise, roots and affixes, they felt, could be unified as morphemes. That was the basic idea. In order to define the morpheme, they argued that the morpheme should be seen as the minimum place where sound and meaning encounter each other. In other words, the minimum unit 
which can be associated both with a phonological definition that this bit of, this stretch of phonological material constitutes the morpheme and with a minimum bit of semantic information. In other words, it would be the smallest meaningful stretch of phonology. Thus, if you have a word like indigestibility, a structuralist would say in is a negative affix, digest is a root, able is an affix which turns the verb digest into the adjective digestible, iti is an affix which turns an adjective into a corresponding abstract noun. So, where we see one word indigestibility, the structuralist morphologist sees a sequence of four morphemes in digest, able, and iti. That was the basic idea. Now, if that idea could be made to work consistently for all material of the languages of the world, then morphology to this day would be based on the morpheme. That is not quite how things work. When you look carefully at the way words are put together and the way words are connected to each other, you find that there are many bits and pieces into which you feel like segmenting words, bits and pieces into which you chop up the words, which don't have any meaning. For example, if you take a series of words like consist, desist, resist, subsist, and compare, with it, compare this series with other series such as confer, defer, refer, suffer, prefer, or other series like commit, demit, remit, submit, permit. If you take these bunches of words, put them together and compare their shapes, you feel compelled to chop them up and say permit consists of two parts, per and meet. Subsist consists of two parts, sub and cyst. Confer consists of two parts, con and fur. If you ask me why I want to chop it up, I will tell you the reason I want to chop it up into these words is when I put these words together and look at their morphological properties, I find confer, differ, refer, prefer, when I go from these verbs to the noun, always take the affix ends. From confer, you have conference. From refer, you have reference. From prefer, you have preference. From differ, you have difference. And since in linguistics, we are committed to making general statements, we don't wish to repetitively say, confer has the nominal form conference, refer has the nominal form reference, differ has the nominal form difference, prefer has the nominal form preference. We want to compress that into a single, maximally general statement, the morpheme fur takes ends to form nouns. And fur is a verbal morpheme. To the verbal morpheme fur, we attach the prefixes con, di, pre, and so on. We wish to make this shorter statement because in linguistics, we are always looking for generalizations of pattern. On these grounds, it becomes necessary then to segment all these mysterious words that I've been talking about into those pieces. But unfortunately for us, unfortunately for the definition of the morpheme as the smallest stretch of sound that carries meaning, fur doesn't carry any meaning. Cyst doesn't carry any meaning. Mit doesn't carry any meaning. Nonetheless, the logic of morphemic segmentation compels us to say, since demit goes to demission, remit goes to remission, 
permit goes to permission, commit goes to commission when you go from verb to noun. Therefore, there is an element mit. Mit has the property that mit becomes mission when you make a noun of it. Therefore, it is a verb. And the rest of it is some kind of prefix that is added to the verb in order to form permit, remit, demit, and so on. So as you see, the logic of the morpheme compels you to postulate lots and lots of bits which are to be considered morphemes because we have no way of stopping ourselves from establishing these morphemes. But it is perfectly clear that they don't mean anything. If we come to Indian languages, if we look at words like ahar, vihar, samhar, upasamhar, of, or if we look at a word like prastav and ask what stav is doing in prastav, whether stav is connected to the word stavak. When we go to other words formed with these upasargas prefixes, followed by these today mysterious elements, which used to have perfectly clear meanings in Sanskrit, but which in present-day Indian languages no longer have consistent and identifiable meanings. We find quickly that in Indian languages, the situation is the same as in these English words. The reason that these English words contain morphemes that are not meaningful is identical to what we find in the Indian languages. The English morphemes mit, fur, cyst, etc come from Latin, and these elements carried specific meanings in Latin, but they have lost these meanings today because their combinations with these prefixes have developed historically in such directions that when you try to look at the diverse range of meanings of confer, defer, prefer, and suffer, and put them together and say what common ingredient of meaning does fur express, that can be held as a common factor between the meanings of suffer, differ, prefer, and confer. You're at a loss for meanings. It becomes impossible to specify what fur means. And you can do the same exercise for meat, and the same exercise for cyst. You arrive at exactly the same answers. And you get exactly the same answers for Indian languages. The result of this discussion is that the logic that leads structural linguists to the postulation of morphemes forces them away from the definition of the morpheme that they wanted to defend. They wanted to defend the definition that the morpheme is the smallest meaningful stretch of sound. Unfortunately, what they've ended up postulating is quite often not meaningful at all but it is the smallest stretch of sound about which careful grammatical and lexical statements can be made. It is a useful concept up to a point, depends on what you wish to do with it. But if you wish to base an entire theory of morphology on morphemes, then you have grave difficulties. Why do you have grave difficulties? Because, as we have been showing you in the preceding modules of this paper, Morphology and Syntax, the way of doing morphology that actually works, that operates with elements from real languages and gives you useful results, and has viable boundaries with phonology on the one hand and with syntax on the other hand, proceeds in terms of the logic of word formation processes, which if they are combined intelligently, give rise to word formation strategies. Now, when you compare morphemes and word formation processes, you find that the two ideas cannot be brought together in the same framework. The moment you try to bring them together in the same framework, you're forced to make bizarre 
and indefensible claims such as that a replacive process turning the English present tense verbs sing and ring into the past tense verbs sang and rang should be regarded according to the morpheme theory as replacive morphemes. Why? Because you see in the morpheme theory what needs to be said is that sang and rang being past tense verbs in English must be morphologically analyzed as parallel to walked and talked and rocked in which there is a clearly discernible final suffix t which indicates the past tense. As a result, a morpheme theorist is compelled to stress the parallel between the final t of walked, which is spelt ed in written English, with the replacive process that turns sing into sang or ring into rang. So a morpheme theorist is compelled to say the word sang really consists of the root sing and an affix which perversely consists of the replacement of e by a. You are therefore forced to say that just as walked consists of walk plus ed. Likewise, the words sang consists of sing plus the equivalent of the past tense affix ed, which in the case of sang is not an affix but a replacive. You are therefore forced to say that sang is not sang. Sang is equal to seeing, followed by, by the way, an additional element which takes out the E and replaces it with A. This mixed up way of talking, which puts elements and processes on the same footing, which pretends that a replacive process can be called an element, defies all efforts to systematize morphology as a branch of a serious science. It defies all attempts to make morphology a well-behaved neighbor of phonology on the one hand and syntax on the other hand, with her both proved to be much easier to systematize. These are the difficulties with postulating a morpheme concept and with trying to make morphemes the central concept of morphology. That is why the structuralist efforts in morphology, which were all based on the morpheme, have now been abandoned. But there is a residue in present day writing about morphology that retains bits of the inheritance of structuralist morphemics you see, they used to call morphology morphemics and they used to call phonology phonemics in order to emphasize their claim that the phoneme is the central unit of phonology and the morpheme the central unit of morphology. Because there are so many writings, including textbooks and other writings that you will need to consult in your further reading, which mention the morpheme concept and build part of their account around that concept, even though all serious scholars today have abandoned the morpheme-based enterprise in morphology. Nonetheless, in this elementary course where we are teaching you about the concepts of morphology, we are forced to inform you that the morpheme theory was a ladder that enabled the history of this subject to set up a reasonable account and after morphologists arrived at the process theory of how words are made from other words, they have on the whole thrown away the ladder. But since some morphologists have kept the ladder as a museum piece in their collection and often take it out and fondly stroke it and show it to their friends, we must, of course, do our duty and tell you about morphemes.
in the field of morpheme based morphology as it existed in the period when structuralism was the way of doing linguistics the 1920s 30s and 40s in that period there were two views of the morpheme for your convenience we will call them the majority view and the minority view the majority view defined the morpheme in terms of the smallest stretch of sound that is associated with meaning and it regarded all these words like confer defer prefer demit remit and so on as exceptions about which they were not concerned theoretically they did not have an account of them and they did not care the minority view took these difficult cases very seriously indeed and therefore those morphologists who believed in the minority view never allowed meaning to become part of the definition of the morpheme so the minority view of the morpheme version of morphology never defined the morpheme in terms of meaning what did they do instead they went to that part of linguistics which is concerned with what is known as the structure of the linguistic sign in other parts of the linguistics course or in other readings that you will do you will have encountered the idea that the linguistic sign as opposed to natural signs are fundamentally arbitrary the word for cat in english does not at all look like the word marjara in sanskrit which means cat or the word billi in hindi which means cat or the word manzar in marathi which means cat or the word shah in french which means cat nonetheless cats are called cat in english and shah in french and manzar in marathi and billi in hindi and marjara in sanskrit and so on this is called the arbitrariness of language this is called arbitrariness because there is no rational cause that can explain why some people call the same animal a cat and others call it a shah and others call it a marjara and so on and so on you see arbitrariness itself is not about meaning arbitrariness is about the conventional character of the way language uses sound to communicate meaning since arbitrariness is about conventionality the minority view of the morpheme seized upon this and used it as the basis of their definition of the morpheme they said the morpheme is the smallest stretch of sound about which systematic statements based on its arbitrariness can be made that ends up saying that a morpheme is the smallest stretch of sound that has a capacity to carry meaning it does not say that every morpheme actually carries meaning that minority theory therefore allows for thousands and thousands of morphemes which do carry meaning and a few exceptional morphemes which have a capacity for meaning but do not exercise that capacity such as mit and demit such as sist and subsist such as for and confer now as you can see the minority could picture of the morpheme is really perverse because the minority picture is compatible with what we do not find in reality it is compatible with a world in which people go around speaking languages in which most morphemes carry no meaning at all and as a result maybe most sentences will be gibberish now we know that people don't go around uttering sentences that are rubbish most of the time we know that dictionaries are not full of morphemes that are meaningless for the most part uh, the overwhelming majority of morphemes if you do set up morphemes are in fact meaningful so what is perverse or strange about the minority view of the morpheme is that in their anxiety to generalize they are forced 
to give the morpheme an extremely counterintuitive definition. They are defining the morpheme in such a way that a few strange exceptional morphemes become the best iconic examples or morpheme kind. As a result, the picture of human language that comes out of this definition does not correspond to how languages actually function. That is the difficulty. However, as you can see, these difficulties arise because of the effort to force morphology to look as much like phonology as possible, so that you have a theory of the morpheme and the allomorph exactly parallel to the theory of the phoneme and the allophone. Once you make that effort, you are forced into these strange definitions. Now that we have looked at the basis of the morpheme theory, it is perhaps of some use to you to look at some examples of how the morpheme theory is implemented. In morphology, the best part of morphology based on the morpheme is there, there are exact procedures to follow and here it is best to stick to the majority view which is looking for meaning in the morpheme because their procedural steps are lucid, they are very easy to teach, they are very easy to learn and you will be well served by learning them even though the version of morphology we are teaching you is a process morphology rather than a morpheme morphology. The first step is to tentatively chop up words into pieces that are likely to come out morphemic. These pieces that are called morphemic segments have conveniently been termed morphs. Morph is simply a short form for morphemic segment. In other words, it is a segment of a word that is likely to correspond to a morpheme. How do you identify morphs? How do you chop up a word into morphemic segments? You do it by comparing words with each other. If you have four words, joy, joyless, sin, sinless, or joy, joyful, joy, joyless, you can look at the similarities between joyful, joyless, sinful, sinless, and say, Joyful and joyless have joy in common and full and less are the different parts. Joyful and sinful have full in common and joy and sin are the different parts. Once you have looked at similarities and differences between words, you get a basis for chopping them up. So when you look at joyful, joyless, sinful, sinless, you have warrant for saying joyful consists of two morphs, joy and full. Sinless consists of two morphs, sin and less. That is the basic logic of how you do the initial segmentation. It's called initial because this procedure is not foolproof. You're likely to make mistakes which will be identified by later steps in the procedure. So these are not morphs, these are morph candidates. So that is your first step. We call it step A, tentatively identifying morphs. Step B is to go a little bit further and group some of the probably related morphs and say these look like they're allomorphs of the same morpheme. Since we suspect that they may be allomorphs of the same morpheme, we call them suspicious pairs or suspicious triplets depending on whether we are grouping two at a time or three at a time and putting them together. What kinds of suspicious pairs are you going to find? Well, if you look at English plurals, for example, if you take cats and rocks, you find there's an S at the end, which corresponds to the final is bit of the words churches and houses. So you suspect that the is at the end of churches and houses because it has the same plural meaning as the final S in a word like rocks or a word like cats you say suspicious pair s, in other words the letter s probably corresponds to is in other words the letters i z that's a suspicious pair now once you've got these suspicious pairs of allomorphs listed 
on the basis of the complete set of data that you're dealing with, you've made fairly long lists and you looked at lots of examples in which these pairs or triplets occur over and over again. Your suspicions become stronger and stronger and you finally say, okay, I'll stop suspecting. I'll accuse these things of having of being culprits. So I will finalize my suspicion, say these are not suspicious pairs, these are indeed pairs of allomorphs. Here are my statements of which morpheme appears as which allomorph in which context. So that's step D, finalizing obvious allomorphy statements. There's a final step, step E, which completes the procedure, is called finalizing non-obvious allomorphy and sweeping up the residue. This is what you have to do in problem cases. Uh, where you have really difficult and exceptional and intractable data and you have to keep revising your statements again and again until you're sure of what you want to say. Uh, in order to do this properly, we want you to look at some data from Southern Havyaka. This is taken from a workbook. The Southern Havyaka data, it's a variant of Kannada. Uh, we'll read the data out to you, not all of it, but a bit of it, just to give you the flavor of what the data is like. So you've got Ottida, he pressed. You got Haley, they, I said. You got Maruttu, it does, and so on. Words like that. Now, when when you take these forms, I've got 23 forms in this set of data. You, if you place phonetically and semantically similar things to each other, uh, you compare. Examples two and three, two is helute, three is helu, helute is I say, and helu is say imperative. You conclude that perhaps TTE in helute marks the first person singular present, I say. However, when you juxtapose these forms with 14, which is marida, you find that in fact the first singular past is ide, which means that uh, the way to look at it is not helu plus tte, but hel plus utte. And in that case, in helu, the u is a distinctive ending for the imperative. Helu is not then the morpheme corresponding to the verb say. Hel is the form corresponding. Uh, this is then the, uh, the morph that you're tentatively segmenting. That gives you the segmentation. Hail, say, u, imperative, utte, first person singular present, ide, first person singular past. Now for all 23 forms, doing this whole thing is what the e-text works out for you in detail. In the lecture, we're only trying to cover the salient points of the e-text. So I refer you to the e-text for the step-by-step -step implementation of steps A, B, C, D. And you will find that there are several false starts, there are several places where an initial segmentation proves to be unsustainable and you're compelled to go back and revise the analysis because you haven't done fine-tuned comparison of form with form. And so when you look at the actual e-text for the Southern Havyaka data, you will find why our final set of morph candidates is uh, ut or ut is present, id alternating with it is past, and so on. And after you've finalized the list of morph candidates, you then put the allomorphs together in suspicious pairs and begin to make proper allomorphy statements. One example of such a statement is the morpheme for the present has two allomorphs, u, t, ut, occurs before tu, and u, t, t occurs elsewhere. The important thing to understand about allomorphy statements goes back to one of our earlier modules where we taught you about specific and general. Allomorphy statements always put the specific environments first and the general environment last. Again, the basic principle of linguistics asserts itself. Specific is given priority 
For example, when you want to make a statement about Southern Havyaka, present tense, ending, allomorphs, you have to say ut, which is ut, occurs before tu. UTT occurs elsewhere. Elsewhere is the general environment after the special cases have been taken care of. That is the basic point to grasp, that in allomorphy statements, all the specific things are listed first. The general thing is elsewhere. It comes at the end. Southern Havyaka is not familiar to me or to most of you. Maybe among you there are some native speakers of it. But if we come to a language that we are used to, such as English, if we come back to the example I mentioned a while ago, the English plural for the noun, let us look at the S of cats and the Z of dogs and the IZ of houses. Of these three, which one is the general elsewhere allomorph? Well, you have to look carefully at what the environments are. S, the voiceless S of cats, occurs only after voiceless plosives. IZ, which you find in houses and so on, only occurs after strident sounds. Strident is a phonological term, which means sibilance and sibilant like affricates. Z occurs after everything else which means Z is what occurs elsewhere. Z is then the default general allomorph, which has to be listed last when you're making these allomorphy statements. That is the fundamental fact to understand in all the procedures I'm telling you. So to summarize, in this module, we have introduced the concept of the morpheme. In certain ways, this is a relatively unusual morphology course because most morphology courses begin by introducing the morpheme and telling you about allomorphs and the context in which they occur and then a couple of chapters down the line the course hems and haws and hesitates and says well you see that was not a very good beginning the morpheme doesn't really work you really have to move out to morphemes and start using processes and then the student begins to wonder why did you begin with the morpheme if you're going to throw it away? So in this course, we have done the opposite. We have begun with processes because that is what everybody uses today. All the people doing serious morphological research use processes today. But in this fifth module, we feel it is our duty to tell you about the older work, even though it is now superseded and no longer used. And it is our duty to show you how that work does align or does not completely align with what is used at present. Thank you for your attention.